Well, hello everyone. My name is Ali Trong. I'm the lead content coordinator here at Supply Pike. And then we have state, the wonderful Stacey Tan. She's our VP of Retail Insights. If you've been on our webinars before, you will know Stacey's face. She's been with us for a while and she has lots of great experience in the supplier world. So I'm really excited to see um, the perspective you bring today to our OTIF benchmarking webinar. And then today we're gonna do a quick review on what OTIF is. So just co cover the, the nuts and bolts of OTIF. We're gonna dive into the OTIF benchmark and the data we've got there. And then we're gonna talk through the OTIF best practices. And I do wanna highlight here that there was a recent change that we saw on Retail Link coming um, in regards to the OTIF disputing process. So we're gonna talk about that um, towards the end of the hour as well. We love providing a full hour of content, so we're going to try and do that today, as well as answer some questions towards the end, and then you have to hop off. We totally understand, but we are going to talk about Supply Pike's OTIF radar demo um, at the last five minutes. Perfect. And then, Stacy, we can go back to that slide. Perfect. Thank you. Um, just some housekeeping things. You can totally take screenshots, write notes um, on today's webinar, but we do send this slide deck out to you um, as well as a recording, and we'll get that to your inbox in around three to four business days. Should be sooner, but we're just giving ourselves some lead way so we can enjoy all the fall things um, that we talked about today. Um, and then best way to ask a question, I do want to point out that I would ask questions now. Um, just because we, if you have any questions about OTIF, we'll kind of save those towards the end or pepper them in as they make sense. But please enter those into the Q&A tab. That's the two speech bubbles kind of overlapping. That's the easiest way for me to see your question and um, tee it up for Stacy. But please continue to use the chat where we talked about all the fun fall things today because that's helpful for us um, just to kind of create that conversation and continue to um, know what other people are thinking about in the supplier community when it comes to OTIF. All right. And then last but not least, if you are new to our webinars and you don't know who we are, we're a part of Supply Pike. Um, we create cloud-based tools that help maximize cash flow and minimize revenue loss. And we do that with a couple a couple different tools. We have one regarding deductions navigator for multiple big box retailers like Walmart, Target, Kroger, and then we're gonna be launching an Amazon here very soon. Um, but today, since we're talking about OTIF, I'll kind of focus around um, our product OTIF radar that helps suppliers um, look at root cause analysis for their OTIF finds, and then you can actually dispute those um, through our application. And um, Stacy, I'm gonna copy what you say because I think it's just pretty wonderful. Um, if your logo isn't up here today, we'd love for you to join the party and be a part of saving some time and money when it comes to your deductions and compliance finds. And with that, Stacy, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Allie. Uh, and like Allie mentioned, just wanted to thank everybody here for being uh, joining us on our call today, talking about fall things and, and OTIF, such a fun talk, topic to cover. Um, so like Allie mentioned, um, the first thing that we kind of wanted to, to do before we dive into the data is just do a really quick overview of what OTIF is, just because we get, um, you know, just people with varying levels of experience and backgrounds on our call. And so we always like to make sure that we are level setting, that everyone is on the same page of understanding what OTIF is, um, so that when we do dive into the data, it kind of makes sense. And you guys have the context and the background uh, to really know what we're talking about when we're, when we're looking at data. Um, so as a very, very quick reminder for everybody on the call, so OTIF is a compliance program uh, with Walmart. Um, there are a lot of other retailers that have similar compliance programs, but as Ali mentioned, kind of for the purposes of today, we're going to be focusing on uh, the Walmart world. Um, so OTIF stands for on time and in 
tool. Um, and essentially it is, an, it is a KPI of supply chain success. Um, so kind of like the name implies, uh, it's Walmart's way of judging, you know, whether the orders that they are trying, you know, they're getting from you, the supplier, um, if they are arriving on time and if they are arriving in full. Um, and we're, we're gonna talk a little bit more about, you know, Walmart's definitions of on time and in full uh, a little bit further along in the webinar. Uh, but essentially this is something that applies to almost every supplier um, that currently sells product to Walmart. So um, why OTIF is a really big deal is because they it is associated with uh, chargebacks. And what that means is um, Walmart does have a very specific OTIF goal or threshold. Um, for those, those of you guys, again, who may be newer to the Walmart world or newer to the uh, OTIF world, um, that goal is 98%. So essentially what that means is Whatever Walmart orders, you have to get it to them 98% on time and 98% in full. Uh, and if you have any cases that basically fall below that level of compliance, below that 98% threshold, you are liable for chargebacks. Uh, and how Walmart calculates those chargebacks are basically 3% of your cost of goods sold. Um, so again, any case that is non-compliant falls below that 98%, you are liable for that 3%. Um, cost of goods sold fine. So um, just again, at a very, very high level, how Walmart calculates OTIF is it's done on a per case basis. Um, and back in the day, they used to measure OTIF kind of as an overall score, uh, but they've recently broken it out into different measurements for on time versus in full. And again, we're going to kind of talk about what each of those different sections mean. Okay, so um, one other thing that I kind of wanted to point out for you guys is, um, you know, we always get a lot of questions of who does OTIF actually affect? Um, should I be caring about it? Do I need to be worried about it? Um, and essentially, if you are currently selling to Walmart uh, brick and mortar, so you actually have product in store, um, it likely does affect you. It affects, I would say, probably 95% plus of suppliers that are in brick and mortar. And we'll talk about the ones that kind of don't fall under the OTIF umbrella in a second. Um, and also if you're an e-commerce supplier, um, so essentially if you fulfill anything through what they call a fulfillment center, um, then you are likely going to be liable to fall under the OTIF program as well. So as of today, um, Walmart's OTIF program does not currently impact uh, Sam's Club suppliers. Now, uh, take that with a little bit of a grain of salt, meaning Sam's Club has its own version of kind of supply chain compliance, but it doesn't necessarily, again, fall under the, the OTIF 98% rule. So they do have their own compliance program, but not kind of officially under the OTIF program. Um, if you are a direct to store delivery supplier or DSD supplier, uh, OTIF does not currently impact you. Uh, direct import suppliers, so that means Walmart actually takes possession of your goods, uh, you know, at the point uh, at the port in your country of origin. So China or India or Vietnam, whatever it is, um, you know, you are not liable for the OTIF program just because Walmart is taking ownership so far up the supply chain. Uh, Walmart International, um, again, Walmart Canada, Walmart Mexico have their own versions of OTIF, but you know, not falling under the program that we're talking about today. Um, and then also for uh, marketplace sellers, um, so essentially you're kind of a third party seller on walmart.com, then you are not currently affected by OTIF. So how OTIF scores are calculated today, as I kind of mentioned, um, Walmart does break them out into the on-time piece and the in-full piece. Um, so it's, you know, thankfully fairly quote unquote self-explanatory on how you can actually understand how your scores are calculated. So for on-time, you know, essentially they're looking at the number of cases that fall within that on-time bucket. And again, in the next slide, you'll see how Walmart, you know, considers on-time. And then they divide it by the number of total cases that were ordered, of course, multiply it by that, by that. 100 and then you're going to get that on-time percentage uh, and then the info piece is you know very straightforward very cut and dry it's just the number of cases um, that they received in full divided by the number of total cases that were ordered you multiply that by 100 and you get the in full percentage um, so you'll see here and we're going to talk a lot more about best practices towards the end of the presentation um, but the goal, of course, is to prevent the need to dispute any OTIF fines and not to rely on OTIF disputing um, because, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, um, disputing OTIF fines is, is 
kind of a painful process. <laughs> um, okay, so the very last thing that I wanted to cover before we kind of hopped into that data that we talked about is really how Walmart is kind of classifying their on time scores and, and their in full scores. So I always like to start with in full just because again, that's really cut and dry and, and really straight to the point. Um, basically, it doesn't matter if you are a prepaid supplier, if you're a collect supplier, it doesn't really matter what category you fall in, food, consumables, general merchandise, whatever it is. Um, essentially, the expectation is that you are fulfilling the orders in full. So if Walmart orders 100 cases from you, um, you are going to be fulfilling at least 98 of those 100 cases. Um, and then again, kind of anything that falls below that 98%, um, you now can be liable to receive OTA fines for anything that is not in full. Um, and again, we're gonna talk a little bit more down uh, further on in the webinar about how you can try to avoid in full fines, like if you have to cancel POs for certain reasons. Um, so there are ways to get around it, um, but again, we just kind of want to establish what the rules are, and then we can talk about how you can kind of get around those rules later on. Um, and Ali, did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of frame up um, what where OTIF um, kind of lies. I know we talked about how, it, you know, Sam's Club has its own product, project or um, compliance program. Um, and then for OTIF, this is US based generally, but this amount also would include Canada, correct? So Canada actually has a has a different compliance program um, and they have a fancy name for it and it's slipping my mind right now. But I've, if I'm not mistaken, Canada's quote unquote OTIF fines are pretty intense. I think they can be up to like 40% of the PO like uh, amount, which is like really crazy. <laughs> um, so for, for these 3% cost of goods, it's just for Walmart US. I, again, Walmart Canada has a completely different set of rules um, and far more harsh penalties, if I'm not mistaken. And I think, like I said, if I recall correctly, 40% is, is what I remember seeing. Yeah, we do have um, a participant in the chat who just said that their, their Canada fees are 20 to 40%. So you're okay. right on the the money there. Um, and I just want to make sure that uh, are the do you feel that these rules are the same different um, in terms of like disputing? Will we kind of get into that a little bit later? Yeah, so I'm not so we're not going to get into the disputing process for Walmart Canada, just because I believe it follows a different process. We'll be focusing mostly on the on Walmart US um, today. I, I want to say, and, and I don't want to misspeak, and it's something we can definitely do a little bit of research on later. Um, I want to say the rules are similar. If I'm not mistaken, they're not as strict as that 98%, but I don't want to misspeak. I do know they have kind of a their own, I've seen that screenshot somewhere, and it's it's actually not, it's not super descriptive uh, compared to the, the Walmart US O2 program, if, I, if I'm recalling correctly. But if you guys are on the call and are current Walmart Canada suppliers, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. We all learn together <laughs> as we like to talk about here at Supply Bike. Yes. And I just made a note for myself um, that maybe in the future we can do a Walmart Canada versus yeah. US O2. I think that would be really cool. Yeah, that'd be super helpful. Definitely. Yeah. All right, awesome. I'll let you get back to it. Thanks. Stacey. Okay, cool. Thanks, Ali. And thank you guys for sharing in the chat. Um, yeah, so, you know, as I kind of mentioned, in full, pretty cut and dry. Um, for the on time piece, so there is a little bit uh, of separation. And how Walmart does that is basically they look and evaluate if you are a prepaid supplier or if you are a collect supplier. So, a uh, super quick refresher course on that. If you are a prepaid supplier, what that means is you, the supplier, are responsible for getting product to the Walmart DCs. So usually what that means is you're going to contract with a third-party carrier uh, like ODFL or whatever it is, uh, or CH Robinson. Um, and you basically, again, are responsible for getting the product to the Walmart DCs on time, so within your uh, MABD or must arrive by date window. So um, if you're a prepaid supplier, essentially kind of the only thing that you are responsible for is making sure that you are delivering to the DCs on time. So basically when Walmart cuts an 
order. They're going to give you the MABD. You will have an MABD window. So different departments have different windows. Um, and we have a screenshot of that for you guys later on in the presentation for your reference. Um, but yeah, just make sure that you get it there within that MABD window. And you also have to make sure that you're scheduling uh, appointments at the DCs. Usually your carrier should be able to handle that for you guys. Um, so just make sure that it's, it gets there on time. If you are a collect ready supplier, um, so collect basically means that the Walmart uh, fleet is backing up to your warehouse or your 3PL and picking it up from you and they are then transporting it to their DCs. Um, essentially, there are kind of two main things that you have to make sure that you're doing as a collect supplier. Um, first one is you have to make sure that you are routing your POs on time. So for those of you guys, again, maybe newer to the space, the uh, expectation for Walmart is that you are routing those POs by 4 p.m. Central Standard Time the day after you receive the POs. So a lot of suppliers think that it's 24 hours or within the same week or just, you know, whenever you can. Um, there is actually a requirement there um, of, again, 4 p.m. Central Time the day after you receive the POs. So there are some pro tips there, like make sure that your review day, you know, isn't on a Friday if you guys don't work on Saturdays. Um, making sure that you know you're aware of when your holidays are and when your offices are closed, uh, submitting things like your office closed templates, uh, just to make sure that Walmart doesn't, you know, can't ding you for saying, oh, you know, you didn't route it by 4 p.m. even though the office was closed. So making sure that you're aware of that. And then the second one, this one is pretty, should be pretty easy, uh, table stakes here making sure that the POs are ready for the carriers to actually pick up. So, um, you know, after you've routed it, you set the appointment and then the Walmart uh, fleet shows up at your warehouse. You wanna basically make sure that those POs are staged and ready to go. Um, you know, so you don't want the truck to show up at your warehouse and you're like, oh no, now we've got to go <laughs> pick them uh, and then load them or whatever it is. So just making sure that those are ready uh, to be picked up whenever you can. Okay, so, and again, same thing, you know, the goal across all of these different metrics is at 98%. Um, so now that we've kind of established what info means, what collect ready means, and what prepaid uh, on time means, we can talk a little bit more about the actual data um, that we're seeing across um, our suppliers. So want to kind of give you guys, um, you know, a, a, an idea of what we are seeing uh, across the industry and across uh, our customer base. Um, so we at Supply Pike, we've basically gathered OTIF data from across 250 different suppliers at Walmart. Um, and these 250 suppliers are across uh, 40 different product categories. Um, so we have pretty um, good data um, that I would say is pretty representative of what we're seeing across the box. Um, so just to give you guys an idea of how we looked at the data and how we're calculating the data. So obviously high level OTIF data is going to be aggregated um, and kind of summed across all of our 250 different suppliers and averaged out. Um, and then what we did from there is and we also broke out um, that data into the three main categories. And these are the main categories that Walmart evaluates. So they look at food. Um, so food obviously is gonna be anything that is under grocery, dry grocery uh, and products like that. Uh, consumables is basically, you guys can think of that as anything that um, is kind of, you use it um, once and then you have to go buy more of it. So things like health and beauty aids, um, you can think of things like, uh, you know, jewelry technically falls under consumables, OTC falls under consumables and things like that. Um, and then general merchandise, I always like to say, think of it as kind of like long haul, long term purchases. Um, so a lot of times you'll see things like electronics or home goods will fall under general merchandise. Um, and these are actually the business units, again, that Walmart evaluates. Um, their different OTIF categories under. And so that is kind of how we bucketed uh, the different data as well. So um, yeah, so we're going to go ahead and hop into the data again, show you guys what we're seeing uh, at a high level across uh, our customer base of 250 plus suppliers. Um, kind of the cool thing about Supply Pike is, you know, there's not really any other company that's able to share this sort of aggregated uh, industry level data for OTIF. And we're really excited to share that with you guys today. 
Um, so just really quickly as well to, to also set the scene. Um, so we are looking at basically 2021 data. Um, for those of you guys who aren't aware, uh, Walmart's fiscal year starts in February and it ends in January um, because of course they have to have their own calendar. <laughs> Um, and so we wanted to basically give you guys kind of an entire fiscal year uh, worth of data. So when we get into February of 2023, uh, we'll be able to kind of do a very similar analysis for the entire fiscal year ending 2022. Uh, so that is why you guys are kind of seeing it, quote unquote, a year behind, but really it's because it's a full Walmart year. So hopefully that makes sense. And if you guys have any questions um, about the data, definitely feel free to let us know and we'll be happy to share that with you guys. Um, but yeah, so as we kind of mentioned earlier on in the webinar, uh, Walmart evaluates their scores by on time and in full. And so we wanted to break that out as well. Um, so overall um, in the year, you know, again, fiscal year 2021 for on time scores, uh, we broke it out into the three different categories. So you'll see food, consumables, and general merchandise. Um, so generally speaking, uh, for our collect suppliers, we saw very, very high scores. So in the 90s, um, no one quite hit that 98% goal. Food got pretty dang close at 97.76%. Um, but by and large, we saw essentially everyone hit the high 90s or, or mid to high 90s uh, if you were a collect supplier. Um, this honestly makes a lot of sense to us just because as we kind of talked about when we we're talking about what the rules are for collect ready, um, it's really quote unquote, not as difficult because essentially you're just having to make sure that you route by that 4 p.m. cutoff time and that your product is staged and ready to go when Walmart actually picks up the goods. Um, so because, uh, because those are the only two things that suppliers are responsible for, once the Walmart fleet picks up product, if they are late to get to the DCs, technically that does not fall under Walmart supplier accountability. Um, and so they don't actually have to worry about fines if you're a collect supplier. Now for prepaid suppliers, again, as a friendly reminder, these are the folks that are responsible for actually getting the product to the DCs in that MABD window. And as you guys can kind of see here, this really suffered um, you know, a lot more than the collect suppliers did. So food and consumables, you know, obviously not at that 98% where you want to be, but 81% considering kind of where we were in 2021 um, with truck driver shortages and warehouse worker shortages and just supply chain being the way it is. 80% um, again, not quite at that 98%, but honestly, all things considered fairly healthy. Um, one thing that really stood out uh, to us as we were doing this analysis is that the Gen Merch suppliers, um, they really suffered quite a bit in 2021 when it came to, to being prepaid. Um, and we think there's a couple of different reasons for this. So obviously, some of it is just to do with lack of product. And we'll talk about that on the info side as well. Um, but we worked with some suppliers who essentially, you know, if they were a prepaid supplier and they were Gen Merch and they didn't have product or product was coming in, but it was coming in late, um, they would still keep those POs open because, you know, stores needed product and you need to get that in stock healthy. Uh, but then what suffered as, as a result of that was actually getting the product there in a timely manner. So um, I think a big driver for that low prepaid score for general merchandise Again, it's just, um, you know, product slow coming into the United States. Um, and then another thing that we saw was that a lot uh, of the, you know, carriers and 3PLs that um, our supplier teams were working with were honestly prioritizing food and consumables. So as I'm sure we all remember, uh, again, kind of 2020, 2021, kind of crazy times for, you know, everybody and everything um, and food and consumables were very much, you know, hot button items who can forget the toilet paper run of 2020. <laughs> Everyone was trying to stock up. And so again, carriers were just prioritizing getting food and consumables out the door um, as quickly as they could and then getting to gen merch essentially whenever they could. So, um, you know, kind of the takeaway for this, obviously if you're a collect supplier, you probably did fairly well in 2021. Uh, if you're a prepaid supplier, definitely hurt a little bit more food and consumables at a healthier range uh, and general merchandise suppliers uh, in the prepaid category really took a big hit 
um, in 2021. And uh, we were, we're already starting to see some 2022 scores um, and it's kind of following a similar-ish trend right now, obviously nowhere near um, as bad as 2021 uh, as you know, supply chains have kind of started to stabilize. Um, but again, once the fiscal year end closes for 2022, we'll do a very similar analysis and we'll be able to show you guys kind of how 2022 was um, for the supplier teams that we work with. So um, in full scores, again, this doesn't really surprise me at all for all the reasons that we talked about earlier. So again, this is for that 2021 fiscal year. Um, so food actually did fairly well. Um, we've thought that you know one of the drivers for this is because a lot of food suppliers um, are actually able to source their products um, either domestically, so within the United States, or just kind of near-ish to the United States. Um, and so their supply chains, again, obviously impacted, but just not as severely impacted um, as the consumables and gen merch suppliers that, again, we all remember <laughs> trying to get product out of China or trying to get product out of India or wherever it is, um, was very, very challenging, um, not only in getting uh, the factories up to speed, and at capacity, but even being able to source containers, um, which again, I'm preaching to the choir here, but we all know basically some of them shot up to like $20,000 a container and things like that. Um, so very, very difficult to get product um, into the US um, in the year 2021. So again, food suppliers seem to have escaped relatively unscathed uh, compared to the other two categories and then consumables and gen merch both sat in kind of that mid 80s uh, range for, again for all of those reasons that we talked about earlier. So um, one thing that we also wanted to show you guys that I thought was pretty interesting uh, was the year over year change. So again, this is 2020 versus 2021, just because of that fiscal year. Um, so as we see, you know, collect, I'm going to kind of gloss over a little bit just because these percentages, um, you know, yes, food is up five and a half percent, but of course, a big chunk of that is just, you know, if everyone is over 90%, it's not going to be quote unquote that impactful. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting was taking a look at the prepaid suppliers again across the different categories um, year over year. So food um, by and large maintained pretty stable. Uh, so, you know, down about 0.3%. Again, not something that I would lose too much sleep over. Uh, consumables uh, was up about 4%. Um, you know, I would say not insignificant, but you know, I would consider that relatively stable considering <laughs> what we've gone through over the last two years. Um, but the stat that really, again, kind of popped out to me was that uh, that general merch um, year over year prepaid score took a really, really big hit again, kind of down 23%. Um, and again, I think it's for all of those reasons that we talked about, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, Carriers, 3PL suppliers, retailers were really just trying to get food and consumables um, back to where, back to healthy levels. And so Gen Merch really kind of took a back seat um, in 2021, just in terms of being prioritized and in terms of being carried um, across the supply chain network in the States. Um, as, full, as far as in full percentages go, uh, this kind of tracked to me. Um, so obviously in 2020, food was down pretty significantly um, just because of, again, just that insane surge in demand in 2020 as everyone was trying to stock up and make sure, you know, we were able to get through the majority of the lockdown okay. So when you look at 2021 versus 2020, it makes a lot of sense to me um, that, you know, food was basically kind of quote unquote back to more normal levels um, and up about 3.7% um, year over year. Uh, for consumables and gen merch, um, you know, again, this also kind of makes sense to me because you saw a trade-off, right? So in 2020, Food was a really big deal um, and consumables too, to a lesser extent. People cared a little bit less about gen merch, you know, just because that's not really a priority during lockdown. But then in 2021, we saw all of that shift and exchange, right? So I'm sure we all remember all of those huge retail reports in 2021 when everyone was like, holiday shopping, back to normal, everything is back to normal. Um, we learned later that that was, you know, not going to last forever. 
But along with that, you see kind of those demand spikes for general merchandise and consumables. Um, so relative to 2020, um, it makes a lot of sense to me that we see kind of in full struggle, um, you know, compared to the food category. Um, so one thing that we also wanted to show you guys um, was just kind of that, um, you know, again, in full and uh, on time change percentage just over time. Um, so, you know, we can see here um, that the in full, there were some positive, um, you know, indications at the beginning of 2021, um, you know, as again, things started to stabilize, supply chain started to stabilize again. Um, but as we all recall, um, you know, we saw a bull up effect of other different impacts across 2021, which then kind of brought those in full uh, percentages down. So um, things, everything that we talked about earlier, um, ever given being stuck in the Suez Canal, uh, you had truck driver shortages, you had container prices spiking, um, you had just the inability to get product out of the different countries, and then simultaneously you have demand spiking at the same time. Um, so it makes a lot of sense to me that, you know, as the year kind of goes on, um, on average, you start to see that inflow percentage dip um, as the year goes by. Um, wanted to show this to you guys as well. Um, again, kind of a year over year from 2020 to 2021, collect and prepaid changes. Um, so the red bar uh, is the prepaid on time and then uh, orange bar is the collect ready. So again, as we can see here, that orange bar, um, you know, collect ready, fairly consistent, because again, quote unquote, it's easy to stay fairly consistent. Um, if all you're doing is just routing and making sure you have product ready to go, if you do a route, uh, where you see the bigger fluctuations across the year, um, we're really on that prepaid on time uh, percentage. So again, you start to see just dips um, as the year goes on. This I thought was pretty interesting. Um, we saw this obviously huge spike uh, in prepaid on time in that April time frame. Um, well, I've been kind of trying to rack my brain a little bit on why that spike might have happened in 2021. Um, I have some theories on it, <laughs> um, but if anyone, if you guys, again, if you're a prepaid supplier and kind of lived through 2021, would love to get your thoughts um, on why that might have been just because again, by and large, you see, you know, again, collect holds fairly steady. You see the prepaid on time, you know, doesn't perform as well in 2021, but then you see that huge spike uh, in April and the smaller ish spike in June. But kind of curious if you guys have any thoughts um, on why that might have happened. Um, but yeah, so uh, by and large, um, you know, generally speaking, I would say that, um, you know, 2021. Um, was kind of, we're starting on the road to normalcy uh, for OTIF scores. Um, as we talked about earlier, um, collect ready suppliers, you know, did a lot better uh, when it comes to the on-time score of about 90% across, you know, both years, 2020 to 2021. Um, and then prepaid suppliers we saw, you know, struggled a little bit more uh, on the on-time piece for various reasons, kind of hovering at around that 77% for 2020 to 2021. So we've got um, a couple of different webinars. Um, so I won't go too into the weeds today um, about kind of the pros and the cons uh, of being a collect supplier versus being a prepaid supplier. Um, generally speaking, we found that if you are a newer supplier to Walmart or a smaller supplier to Walmart, uh, collect ready tends to be a little bit more beneficial just because as we mentioned, um, you're not really responsible for getting the product there in a timely manner. Um, you just have to make sure that you're routing on time and have the product ready to go. One of the cons, of course, of being a collect ready supplier is that you just have a little bit less control over when your product actually gets there. Um, and you know, that has kind of downstream effects on things like your OTIF or your in stock, uh, you know, your sales potential and things like that. And then kind of the opposite, of course, is true for a prepaid supplier. So obviously, um, if you're a prepaid supplier, you have 
total control over when your product actually gets to the Walmart DCs. Um, but then kind of the negative side of that is that you are then, you know, much more liable for OTIF scores uh, on the on-time side. Um, and again, anything that falls below that 98%, you are now responsible for, and you have to pay those fines for. So, um, We've been seeing just fun insights for you guys uh, across the board. Um, for a long time, suppliers were slowly making the move towards prepaid just because they want the control of their supply chain and they want to be able to, again, you know, say, hey, I need this to get you know, to this DC on this date to make sure that we're hitting our in-stock goals and hitting our sales goals and things like that. Um, but slowly we start to see suppliers start to migrate back to being on the collect side because of the OTIF scores. Um, you know, suppliers don't want to be liable for those prepaid on time scores. Um, but now recently, uh, Walmart just announced something called the collect pickup program. Um, we've got a couple of articles on that that go in depth um, into what those fees are, but essentially it's a new fee structure that Walmart has introduced. Um, if you are a collect supplier and you essentially use Walmart's fleet or Walmart's freight, um, you are now going to be charged a pickup fee um, based on your department, as well as a fuel surcharge. So for you know, their fleet having to get gas and, and transport your goods across the country, um, they now want to charge you a fee for that. So that just dropped. Um, the, the most recent fines just were released in September for collect suppliers. Um, and so now we're starting to see suppliers again, start to evaluate, start to think about, start to figure out if they want to start moving back towards being a prepaid supplier. Um, and essentially they're trying to weigh out um, which is going to cost more money, um, paying those collect pickup program fees or you know, potentially having to deal with prepaid on time um, OTIF fines. So um, there's a lot going on in the supplier world. Um, and, you know, as I kind of mentioned, we have a lot of really great resources that are totally free if you want to read about them and learn more. Um, and of course, our team is here and available if you guys have any questions about um, any of these um, different programs. Thank you for that, Stacey. That was really insightful. And I'm sharing lots of things in the chat right now about the collect versus prepaid choice that we have a webinar at the end of the month. I'm sharing the um, collect pickup program resources we have. We have three articles and a webinar. Um, and then also to your point earlier, I'm you made so many good points. I was just taking notes um, and trying to get all these links sent out. Back to that chart, I think- um, I'm not the, sure I understand. Sorry, that was my watch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I understand these uh, <laughs> funds either, but back to that chart that you showed earlier of the collect versus prepaid, I think, during this time, I, I was in the supplier world. I was working. Um, it's that uh, collect versus prepaid, the um, pink and yellow one. Oh, sorry. No, you're good. You're okay. good. Um, lots of charts, lots of data. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, during this time, I was working in the supplier world, and I'm just going back to the like two steps forward, one step back yes. that a lot of our supply chain um, was facing um, just because, you know, we would get we would wait for two months. So like February and March, we'd be down on product. And then April, we could like oversupply everyone. Mm. And it would just continue to do that. So I wonder if people can put in the chat if they, they experienced that too. I remember just being like, we're out of the woods, we're out of the woods. And then the next month would be even worse than before. We're back so. in the woods. We're back in the woods. <laughs> yep. <laughs> for sure. For sure. But I'm going to share those prepaid um, webinars and all the things that you mentioned in the chat. Okay. So uh, I'll let you go get back to the content, but I was taking notes furiously because I could not keep up with all the good things that you're saying. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ali. Super helpful as always. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so that guys is, is kind of the, the data um, that we wanted to share with you guys. And, and to, this is the first time we're doing an OTIF benchmark report. Um, so if there is any data that you guys would like to see uh, as suppliers, 
please feel free to drop that into the chat or you know shoot us an email and we'll make sure that we kind of include it in future benchmark reports. Um, and then again, as we do the, the 2022 fiscal year end report, um, you know, we'll make sure that we include those, those points of data as well. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to share that with you guys and then also uh, transition the last little bit to talk about some of the best practices for OTIF. Um, just because a lot of feedback we get sometimes is like, hey, this data is great and super helpful, but what can I do with it? What does any of this mean? <laughs> um, you know, what are actionable takeaways that I can do as a supplier? So we wanted to make sure that we covered that as well um, for you guys. Um, so really quickly, I wanted to start with, you know, the in full piece, uh, just because again, you know, I, I say it's cut and dry and I say it's straightforward and I, you know, it, it really isn't. There's a lot going on um, in, in just the world of being a supplier right now. Um, but some of the best practices that you can really kind of try to implement to help with the info piece is number one, make sure that you're always reviewing and monitoring your forecasts. Um, and right along with that, you guys will see kind of beneath that is to make sure that you are kind of creating and reviewing supply and demand plans. So one thing that I like to call out and make sure that suppliers are aware of in case you, you don't already know is Walmart actually has two different forecasts for its suppliers. So one of them is the GRS forecast, um, and that is specifically around what Walmart expects you to sell at the store level. And then the other one is something called a supply plan, um, and that is what Walmart expects to order from you, the supplier. So technically, the supply plan is built off of GRS, which makes sense. So you know, Walmart expects that you're going to sell a thousand units in the next you know, three months. And so based on that, they're probably going to order 1200 units, you know, with some buffer um, to make sure that they have enough to satisfy the GRS forecast. So Walmart tends to order um, based on the supply plan that is available. And so one of, I, you know, I like to say kind of a, a warning sign or a warning bell to know if you're going to be able to be in full is to, is to review your supply plan. Um, now, I work with enough suppliers to know that the supply plan is not always accurate <laughs> um, and how Walmart actually evaluates their supply plan, which I think is kind of crazy, but it's it's how they do it, is they look at it on, on a rolling eight week cadence. Um, so you guys will find that, you know, hey, maybe this week Walmart said they were going to order 100, but they only ordered 50. Um, and then next week Walmart said they're going to order 100, but they ordered 150. Um, if it evens out to kind of those 200, Walmart says that, oh, you know, on a rolling eight week basis, I just use two weeks as an example, but on a rolling eight week basis, it averaged out correctly. So I always recommend when you're looking at your supply plan, be looking at least eight weeks out. And that should give you a general indication of what Walmart is expecting to order from you. Um, so make sure that you know what your supply plan is, and then make sure that you're then looking upstream and planning um, with your factory teams based on Walmart's supply plan. Now, obviously, I'm talking in very generalized terms. Um, this is, of course, if you kind of have a regularly replenishing product, you're not in seasonal, you're not promo, you're not a guaranteed buy and things like that. Um, but just generally speaking, make sure that you're evaluating your supply plan, I would say at least bi-weekly. Um, I you know, usually try and recommend that you look at your supply plan on a weekly basis because it is something that does fluctuate and change every single week. So make sure you're taking a look at that. Um, other things that I would also also kind of recommend is make sure that you are also marking your packaging. Um, this seems kind of duh uh, <laughs> to a lot of suppliers, but you would be surprised or maybe not surprised um, by how many issues we see um, our suppliers have when it comes to in full and shortages um, as it relates to just Walmart's DCs being unable to receive things correctly. Um, so Walmart is working on automating a lot uh, of, you know, their receiving processes of the DCs. So I'm sure you guys have heard of the SQEP program, which is really aimed at helping to automate the DCs. Um, but for right now, it is a very, very manual process. It is some guy unloading product from the truck and literally scanning in each barcode to make sure that the product is received. Um, so if you have any issues with your barcodes, with your labeling, um, essentially, Walmart can say, oh, we didn't receive this product um, and essentially kind of ding you for not being in full. 
Um, the other thing to think about um, if you know that you cannot fulfill your product completely is to make sure that you are canceling your POs. Um, and the key here is to use a Walmart reason code whenever possible. So um, for those of you guys who maybe are not aware, Walmart actually has, um, so if you've ever canceled a PO before using Nova in Retail Link, you have the ability to kind of put in a PO cancellation reason. And Walmart actually has different accountability owners for each of these cancellation reasons. Um, so let's just say um, if there was, you know, if you don't have enough product available and you cancel it, then understandably it's kind of your fault as a supplier, but then there are a bunch of other codes that actually will fall under Walmart's accountability. And what that means is if you use those PO cancellation codes um, and it's Walmart's fault, so to speak, you will not be fined um, if you cancel those POs. Now, I will say as a caveat, um, you know, you need to make sure that when you are using a, a Walmart cancellation reason that it is valid. Um, you can't like not have product and be like, oh, it's Walmart's fault <laughs> because someone is checking that um, and they will say, hold on, that doesn't make any sense. Um, and then, you know, they'll come and get you for it. But whenever possible, a lot of suppliers, they just don't even know that there's cancellation, different reason codes, and they'll just pick a random one. So our best practice is try and pick a Walmart one when that's correct. Um, and then of course, you know, if it really is a supplier reason code, then you have to use a supplier reason code accordingly. Um, so other things that, you know, we kind of talked about earlier with regards to being on time um, is you want to make sure again that your carrier is scheduling a delivery appointment with the DC um, and that it is arriving within the MABD window at the DC. And I'll show you guys what those MABD windows are uh, on the next slide. Um, this is actually, you'd be surprised um, for the suppliers that we work with. This is honestly very, very low hanging fruit. Um, a lot of the teams that we work with, sometimes if they, if you're working with kind of a smaller, more regional carrier, um, they may not know that Walmart has MABD window requirements. Um, we work with a surprising amount of suppliers that are prepaid, um, whose carriers are not even setting appointments within the MABD windows. Um, and so if you're setting an appointment before the MABD window or after the MABD window, you're already a step behind. There's no way you're gonna land within that window and time frame. So these are things that you need to make sure that you are paying attention to, doing analysis on, um, making sure your carriers are actually doing what they should be doing. Um, and then of course, collect ready, as we talked about earlier, uh, making sure that the orders are confirmed and routed by that 4 p.m. central time, the day after the PO is sent. Um, and as I said, holidays and weekends count, the clock does not stop. So if you get your review day on Friday, you have to technically get that PO routed either by Friday or by 4 p.m. on Saturday. If your office is closed on Saturday, Walmart says tough luck, um, you need to move your review day. And that's actually something that your Walmart team can help with. So I would also make sure that you understand what your review day is so that you know that you can route by 4 p.m. Um, in order to not get hit with a, with a collect ready on time fine. And then again, this one, hopefully kind of easy, um, making sure that your order is ready. So when the Walmart uh, carrier actually shows up, it's ready to go staged um, and, and ready to go from there. Um, so uh, we talked about earlier, the MABD window. You guys have heard me say that a lot. Um, again, it stands for the must arrive by date and it's the window of time that you have to deliver your cases to be compliant. Um, and MABDs are actually calculated by your lead time. Um, and this is something that, you know, you actually tell Walmart um, way in advance. Like when you first sign your contract with Walmart, you are actually submit a lead time audit form. Um, and I always like to bring this up because people forget, you know, you do business in Walmart for five years and you're like, when did we send this? What is this again? Um, so, you know, again, all new suppliers have to submit something called a lead time audit form. And if you guys are having struggles, you know, either consistently arriving early or consistently arriving late, um, one thing that I would do is actually ask to see your lead time audit form. Um, your replenishment team should be able to provide that to you. And then you can basically make determinations if that lead time audit form is still accurate or if you need to change 
um, any date. So maybe you guys are more efficient now and your processing time is a lot faster. Um, and so you can actually change that. And then Walmart, again, will calculate that MAVD based on how much time you need uh, to process the order and actually get that order shipped out. So um, if you haven't looked at your lead time audit form in a minute, highly recommend checking that out um, whenever you can. So um, the delivery windows, Walmart essentially has three delivery windows. And again, um, I will show you guys in the next slide. I keep saying the next slide, I promise it actually is the next slide. Um, all of the del delivery windows across the different departments. Um, but essentially, if you have a one day window, you have to arrive exactly on that MABD date. So let's just say uh, your MABD is October 12th, um, then it must arrive on October 12th. Uh, if you have a two-day window, then the order has to arrive either the day before or the day of the MABD date. So it can either be October 11th or October 12th. Um, and then Walmart also has an 11 a.m. to 11 a.m. window uh, when the order has to arrive basically 11 a.m. the day before the MABD and 11 a.m. the day of the MABD. Um, and yeah, as Ali mentioned, uh, don't worry about having to take screenshots or take notes. We will share this with you guys. Uh, but generally speaking, these are Walmart's uh, OTIF expectations around their MABD windows. So again, if you are a collect supplier, you don't really need to worry about this. Um, it will get there when it gets there. <laughs> uh, Walmart's fleet will just, you know, it happens. I would say well, for Walmart's fleet, if you're about 40 to 50% on time, you're doing pretty good. Uh, but for prepaid, again, you're responsible for getting the product there on time. Um, you do need to adhere to these different delivery windows within that 98% threshold. Um, so again, you guys will get a copy of this later on. So don't worry too much about that. Um, so the last thing that I want to cover, and I'm going to blaze through this really fast, um, just because I want to make sure we have enough time for questions, um, but I want to talk really quickly about disputing OTIF fines. Um, so generally speaking, as you guys can see here, um, this recurs on a monthly basis. So OTIF fines are um, evaluated monthly. So you need to be looking at your OTIF scores at the very least on a monthly basis, I would recommend a minimum of weekly, bi-weekly is kind of pushing it. Um, and you know, you can see here that there's a two-step defense system. Um, so, you know, kind of the quote unquote old way of working was that you could dispute it with your buyer. Um, and essentially how that would work is that um, you would have a projected OTIF fine. So there's a two week window between when an OTIF fine is projected and then when it is actually invoiced. So when it is projected, so Walmart is saying, hey, we're pretty sure you're going to get invoiced with this OTIF fine. Technically, you can work with your buyer to try and get that fine waived. And if your buyer agrees to waive that fine, then you will not actually get invoiced for that fine. Um, so one thing to note is that Walmart just recently, and when I say just recently, I mean literally two days ago, uh, introduced a whole new step uh, to disputing OTIF fines with your buyer. You now have to ask your buyer to fill out something called the OTIF buyer payback template. Um, and you guys can see screenshots here. And we will share um, this template with you guys in our follow-up emails. Uh, but yeah, before Walmart buyers could just email their bosses and say, yes, waive these OTA fines. Now they actually have to fill out this payback template um, if you want them to waive any of your OTA fines. So just be aware of that. And then, as I mentioned, kind of that two-step defense process. So if, let's just say, for whatever reason, your buyer does not waive your OTIF fine, either they don't agree or they're busy or they don't fill out this new payback template, whatever it is, um, there is now a new-ish process where you can actually fight OTIF fines in high radius. Um, and high radius is a third-party app. Um, you should see all of your AP fines, so OTA fines, sweat fines, uh, collect pickup program fees all flow through high radius. Um, and you can now dispute your OTA fines in high radius up to 13 months uh, in arrears. So if you do end up disputing through high radius, um, you know, your scorecard will not change, but how that works is if Walmart does approve your dispute, they will create a credit memo, um, basically crediting, crediting you back um, for that OTIF fine, which then becomes visible in high radius. So essentially two processes before the fine gets invoiced, uh, when it's still in projected status, you can work with your buyer. 
once it gets invoiced, um, your buyer can't really do anything anymore. Um, at that point, you would then dispute the O to fine in high radius. And I know I kind of glossed over this really, really fast. Um, as Ellie mentioned, I'm sure she's going to be sharing a lot of resources around our different OTIF webinars. We have an hour long one that goes into a step by step how you actually dispute OTIF fines. Um, so I would highly recommend checking that out if you're curious um, to learn more about these two different um, OTIF processes. So um, just to make sure that we have enough time for questions, uh, I'm going to blaze through these guys um, and not kind of go through them. Again, you'll have access to this deck afterwards, um, but we share with you guys kind of the different information that Walmart expects to see during the OTIF dispute process, um, you know, kind of what is helpful for on-time disputing, what is helpful for in full disputing, and then some optional documentation for OTIF disputes. Um, yeah, so I think We've got four minutes, Allie. So all right, rapid fire round. <laughs> yes, let's start with um, fixes for chargebacks. So as you know, shortages when loads are shipped in full per the POD. If this happens a lot. We see, you know, the POD is right, but then you're short. You basically get a short shipping fee, um, or they add overages to different POs. Can you kind of talk about? what the solutions for that look like? Yeah, so very interesting question, Allie, and something I kind of started alluding to, but didn't really get to too much. So Walmart has, I would essentially say, three different ways they can hit suppliers now, three main buckets, let's put it that way. There are a lot of little buckets, but three main ones are the O2 fines, uh, the AP shortages, uh, and then the SQEP fines. So, um, I, I'm gonna to speak to the shortages just because just that's what the question was, was asking about. So we have found, according to um, Walmart, um, if you want to dispute an OTA fine, they actually say that PODs and BOLs, so your shipping documents are actually not really looked at at all um, when it comes to OTA fines. So Walmart basically says that they have all the data they need uh, within their internal systems to determine if a product was received in full or not. This goes for both shortages and overages um, on the OTIF side. So we have had suppliers that will send in PODs or BOLs and Walmart says, thanks, but don't bother. We don't look at those when it comes to OTIF fines, which kind of sucks. Um, now, shortages, AP shortages, which is when Walmart short pays your invoice because they say we didn't receive everything, they do receive and they do expect you to submit your PODs and your BOLs. And they will uh, agree to those disputes if you have proof documentation. Um, so why I kind of bring, and, and this goes through a completely separate system called APDP, which is the Accounts Payable Dispute Portal. Um, and why I bring these two up is because Walmart sees these as independent kind of arms. So for OTIF, essentially, they're saying, don't send us any proof documentation. We don't look at it. We've got all the data we need. I know it's not helpful to the supplier that's asking, but essentially they say, we don't, we've got all the data we need. Um, on the shortages side, the AP shortages side, yes, do send in that documentation because they do evaluate that. They do expect it, in fact. Um, and if you have proof, you know, that you did deliver in full or that you've, you know, loaded the truck in full, they will accept your dispute and they will pay you back on that. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Two totally different teams. And what's crazy is even if, let's say, the AP shortages team approves your dispute, that does not necessarily mean that your OTIF fine will be waived and vice versa. You have to be fighting on multiple fronts um, when it comes to revenue loss at Walmart, unfortunately. Yes, and we've got lots of webinars on that. Um, actually, I'll kind of reference, we're, we're having a decoded conference that um, we're gonna cover deductions versus compliance fines. So you can sign up for that. I'll send the link in a second, but I, we'll get to one more question before we kind of end today's conversation. I got ahead of myself there. I'll send the link in a second for this. <laughs> it's free, but um, it's happening on Thursday and it's going to be all day. You can come all day or you can attend the sessions that are most relevant for you so you can fit them into your busy schedules. Um, mm -hmm. Stacy, I'm going to go back to the Q&A because I just I want to make sure we get some <laughs> questions um, answered. So the department numbers, I was okay. doing a little research um, in the background. Are the department numbers the same in Canada and the U.S.? 
That is a good question. I don't think they are. I do not believe so. Um, my Canada friends, you guys are putting my feet to the fire. I love it. It's something I need to go do some research on. Um, I don't believe they are. Um, but Ali, let's, we can make it a point definitely to, to follow up and definitely do a, a Walmart US versus Walmart Canada OTIF article resource webinar, and then also make sure we can check on the departments as well. Great question. Though. I'm sorry to have the answer right now. No, a hundred percent. We are in U US land all the time, but I, I know that Canada has its own plethora of issues, literally just pinged our research team during this. And I was like, we're doing this, this is happening. So Perfect. be on the lookout for that. <laughs> um, Perfect. Um, we have time for maybe one more question. Um, oh, no, we don't. It's 1201. So we'll, we'll go on to this portion um, and we'll put our emails here in just a second. So if you do have questions that we didn't get to, I know there were kind of a lot of questions towards the end. Um, we will be able to answer those. I wanted to spend a beat here. Um, we are having an open call for speakers. So something that Supplier Wiki does, we put on in-person events um, that essentially just help educate um, the supplier community and we record those and then po post them on our websites. So if you're local to the area or not, we're looking for speakers who would be interested in sharing their industry insights. So I'll send the link um, to the form to fill out, which is essentially just, you know, give us an idea of what you want to talk about, what you think other suppliers should know. Now we know um, US Walmart Canada. Canada. Yes. We're going to come find you Walmart Canada suppliers. You guys are going to come do a Zoom a webinar with us. <laughs> yes. So we're, we're looking for speakers who may want to be on webinars as well as some at some of our in-person events. Um, so if you're interested, I will share the link in a second. Stacey, I'll go quiet. Um, if you want to go ahead and, you know, send us off and talk about emails and how to contact us. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, and yeah, so as, as Ali mentioned, I always feel so terrible because we always get more questions than we have time for, unfortunately. Uh, but these are our real email addresses. So if you guys have any questions, um, please, please, please feel free to email us. We are more than happy to help. Um, and if we don't know the answer, we will hunt down people that do know the answer and make sure that you get those answers. Um, you can also check us out at supplypike.com. Um, we have information about um, our products as well as pricing if you're curious. And then you can also link out to our education page, uh, Supplier Wiki, um, and you will be able to access all of this free um, content, ebooks, articles, resources um, available for the supplier community. Um, so yeah, so I think the very last thing that we're going to do in the next just two minutes. Um, it's just a really quick overview of OTIF radar. Um, so this is uh, our take here at Supply Pike uh, on the on-time in full program uh, at Walmart. Um, you know, we, we do our very best to give you guys a full hour of content. And um, so if this is where you guys hop off, no worries at all. Thank you guys for hanging out with us for an hour. Uh, for those of you guys who, again, who are just curious to see what we work on here at Supply Pike, uh, we're happy to kind of show you what that looks like. And I will go ahead and hop over to OTIF Radar. Um, so yeah, super, super high level overview um, of OTIF radar, some of the cool, um, you know, value props that we have for the application. So number one, um, we are able to store your data indefinitely. So if you guys are pulling data out of the OTIF scorecard and retail link, um, you know that technically the data only goes back 13 weeks and it's rolling, uh, you know, every single week. So if you're not saving data every week, you're losing that 14th week of data when the new week rolls around. Um, you guys can see here, obviously this is just a demo account, um, but we are able to pull and store data for you know multiple years at a time, not only for your scores, but also your fines over time. Um, other cool things that we do at Supply Pike is that we can actually project out fines for you. So remember we talked about um, having to work with your buyers to actually, you know, get certain fines waived. Um, you know, Walmart's OTA scorecard does not show this to you. So you actually have to do math and analysis on your own in the back to figure out what you can actually go and waive. We handle all of that for you. 
Not only that, but we actually do it in a way where you can click on any of these metrics um, and we will take you to the relevant POs um, that are already filtered down um, to, for you so that you can basically just start getting to work without having to do you know, 10 different types of analysis to get to the same number. Um, one other thing that I wanted to share you guys really quickly that you cannot get um, out of Retail Link is we provide uh, the o your OTIF score uh, and your OTIF performance across multiple points of view. So things like your carriers, your origins, your departments, and things like that. So a great example is if you're a prepaid supplier, you can click into the carriers page, for example. Um, and then for whatever month you're looking at, you can actually see um, how much each carrier that you're working with is costing you. Um, so we've actually had teams utilize this um, and improve their bottom lines by basically working with, and this is all dummy data. So, you know, if you're working with CH Robinson, don't go yell at them, it's not real. <laughs> uh, but being able to go to their carriers and say, hey guys, you know, we provided all the product in a timely manner, but you're only 56% on time. And now that's costing me $22,000. I'm either going to pass that fine on to you, um, or we need to negotiate better rates, um, you know, as we continue our partnership together. Uh, we can even show you things like your historical performance by carrier over time as well. So if it really is at that 56%, you know, you can say, hey, was this a blip? You know, things happen. Global supply chain is what it is. Or, wow, you know, this performance has, you know, steadily been decreasing over time. You're costing me more and more money. Um, that's a problem. And we need to be able to reevaluate, you know, our relationship with this carrier. Um, very last thing I'll show you guys um, is the orders page. So as I kind of mentioned, you know, we're able to help you slice and dice and get down to very specific issues um, that, you know, you can filter to. And then let's just say, you know, you want to go and dispute uh, the fines for these 41 POs. You can actually select all of them um, and hit this one click button and we will automatically um, either create a dispute document packet for you to send to your buyer so you don't have to put it together um, or we can even automatically submit um, the dispute for you on high radius, literally with one click. So you're not having to go in, find the order, literally say for this PO, for this many units, here's my POD, here's this, here's that. Uh, we've done all of that aggregation for you. So yeah, I know I'm three minutes over, so I'm going to stop here. I've talked a lot very quickly and very fast, uh, but hopefully this is helpful for you guys. Um, last kind of thing that I'll leave you with. So we do offer a free trial where we'll actually pull your data into the app. Um, I know a lot of times looking at dummy data, you know, you're kind of like, this doesn't really mean anything to me. Um, but we can pull your data into the app, take a look at your information, actually offer you insights. Um, you, you're even allowed to dispute OTA fines in the application. Um, I recommend it, I'm a big fan, just because I always say more inf information is better than less information. Um, if you pull the data into the app, everything looks great, then awesome. You know, let's not worry about that too much then. Um, but if you pull data into the app and you start to see, you know, opportunities or insights and you're like, oh, you know, maybe we're not as on top of it as we thought we were, um, then that is something that our team can support you with. So um, I will leave it at that. Allie, did I miss anything? No, you knocked it out of the park as always. Thank you, Stacy, for walking us through the content and the demo today. And thank you to all of our participants for joining us this hour. Hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday and do something very fall like Aww. this. Yeah, good yeah. pumpkin patch. And send us yes. pictures. We love seeing this. <laughs> yes. All right, take care, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.